Good morning. Welcome to the Ridge and those that are online, our church family, welcome to the service this morning. We're here to worship God wherever we are, in this building or in your home, we are here to worship the Lord this morning. And we have a, a wonderful family, Brent and Michelle Pruitt and their daughter Mackenzie and then they have another daughter named Riley, Riley and then Beckett. Beckett are all with us today. So they're our guest worship leaders, so let's make them feel welcome today. Thank you. So, so much for being with us. Stand with me, if you will. Let's open up in prayer. Lord, this is the day that you have made. This is your day, God. And we have gathered in your name, online and in person, to worship you, Lord. So we pray, God, that the Spirit of the Lord will be strong and mighty wherever we are. Draw us into your presence, Lord. Fill us with your presence. And may the word of God affect how we live and behave. Change us by your glory. And we will be careful to give you all the thanks and praise. In the amazing name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Now, come on. Let's all worship together today. God is good. Amen. Come on, if you would, just throw your hands up to him this morning. Father, we just love you, Jesus. So grateful, Lord, for who you are, God. I already felt the presence this morning when we came in this place. Holy Spirit, have your way in us this morning. We're so thankful for your grace and for your mercy. We just love you, G. Come on, who breaks the power? Who breaks the power? Sin in darkness, whose love is mighty and so much stronger. The King of glory, the King above all kings. Who shakes the whole earth with holy thunder? Who leaves us breathless in awe and wonder? The King of glory, the King above all kings. Come on, lift your voice. This, this is, is amazing, amazing grace. This is unfailing love. That you would take my place. That you would bear my cross. You would lay down your life. That I would be set free. I sing for all that you've done for me. Come on, has you been good to you? Who brings our chaos? Who brings our chaos back into order? Who makes the orphan a son and daughter? The King of glory, the King above all kings. With truth and justice Shines like the sun in all of its brilliance The King of glory, the King above all kings Oh yeah, this is amazing grace This is unfailing love That you would take my place Has he been good to you this morning? We're so thankful for all you've done, Jesus. We lift you up, Lord. We exalt your name this morning. Come on, sing, Worthy is the Lamb. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy, worthy, worthy. Oh, this is amazing grace. Oh, yeah. This is unfailing love. That you would 
Sing it out. And worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who. Sing it one more time. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Come on, if you believe that, let's just worship Him, Lord. You are so worthy, God. You're so worthy, Lord, and we worship You. We honor You, Lord God. You, you're the Lord of our life. You're the sustainer of all life, God. We praise the greatness of who You are. I want to go to the Lord in prayer. Um, I got a message this morning that Andy Taylor was taken to uh, the emergency room with, with like some really, a, a lot of pressure behind his eye. And so I don't know much more than that, but let's just pray for Andy. And, uh, and I see Shelly's with us. She just came through back surgery. So it's great to see you back this morning. If you're here this morning and you need prayer, would you just raise your hand? We, we're not doing the classic kind of altar service, but God still can touch us. Isn't that amazing? God can touch us wherever we are. Those of you that are online, if you need prayer, just by faith, we're all covered together. Isn't it awesome that, that especially in this time, that we are limited, but God is not. And, and He is here, and He's there, wherever you are at the same time. So let's just pray. Father, there are those in our family who need your powerful healing touch today, God. And we pray for them, Lord. We thank you, God, that healing is ours because of the grace of Jesus Christ. By his stripes, we are healed. So I pray, Lord, that our church family that need healing this morning, that no matter where they are, that the power of the Holy Spirit would be upon their bodies, that you would send that wonderful, dynamic healing word and heal us of all of our diseases, that you would strengthen us, Lord God, that you would keep us close as a church family, keep us knit together, God, in the grace of the Lord. Thank you, God, for protecting us, Thank you, Lord, for safety and for health during these days that we're living in. And we're very, very careful to praise you for it all. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You may be seated this morning. It is so, so good to see all of you here. And by faith, it's great to see all of you that are online this morning. My phone is always on, so I can kind of, I, I feel like I'm pastoring two groups of people. So, and it's turned down. So, uh, we already checked that. So, I want to make sure. Hey, let me, let me just make a couple of announcements. We're, we're collecting a few things. Um, Simply Sisters, which is a wonderful ministry, is collecting baskets. Um, they take those baskets and they fill them with all kinds of goodies and they create care packages to deliver to people. So if you have some ex extra baskets at home, you know, just not, not, you know, not tote size, but, you know, just a good size basket. If you want to bring them, there's a place outside to donate those and help us out with that. And then um, um, because, of, because of the pandemic, some of our volunteers in the nursery and preschool are watching online. So it's kind of created a vacuum with our kids' ministry in that area. So if you'd be willing to help us once a month in the nursery or the preschool, uh, if, you will, if you'll see Tracy, uh, she'll get you hooked up and we'll get you on schedule. We're just trying to have enough volunteers that you only do it once a month or once every six weeks. So thank you so much for stepping up. Now, let me kind of give you a little report. If you looked out there, there's, a, there's a, a mountain of supplies that are going to Timber Ridge Elementary this week. There's hand sanitizer and masks and um, uh, some school supplies for the office and um, all uh, wipe, disinfecting wipes, all the things that they need. You have responded. So we're taking those on Tuesday. 
But they've asked us, they want to paint circles. They want to paint uh, circles that will be six feet apart uh, to kind of create an outside classroom. And so we need some volunteers. If you're willing to help us, we're going to go paint. If you'll see Pam, we'll work out what day we're going to do that. But we're going to go paint. Sur- this is going to be fun. We're just going to go paint on the sidewalk <laughs> and have a really great time and uh, just do one more thing. So thank you for your incredible response to Reach Broken Arrow. We have now received $8,000 for benevolent outreaches that we're doing. And we're just about to finish this one. And now we're going to get, we're going to target the next thing. As I preached last week, that, that this is our pathway of ministry right now. And you are responding so generously. Thank you, thank you, thank you so very much. Uh, also, just remind you, thank you for being so faithful with your tithe and offering. You can give on your way out of the building. You can give online. You can mail it to the church. Thank you for being incredibly faithful to, to support the church during this time. It, it, we're, we're in really good shape. And that's the blessing of God and your generosity that is making that happen. All right, let's stand again and let's just really now, let's just open up and worship as we prepare our hearts for God's word today. Amen. We worship you, Father. I feel such a sweet presence here today. We just love you, Father. We're so thankful, God. Worship you, God. No weapon may be formed, but it won't prosper. And when the darkness falls, it won't prevail. Because the God I serve knows only how to triumph. And my God, We'll never fail. Let's sing that again. The weapon may be formed. Oh, the weapon may be formed, but it won't prosper. And when the darkness falls, it won't breathe. Because the God I serve knows only how to triumph. Oh, and my God, we'll never Never fail, my God. We'll never fail. Cause I'm gonna see a victory. I'm gonna see a victory. For the battle belongs to the Lord. I'm gonna see a victory. I'm gonna see a victory. For the battle. This morning, we're gonna see a victory. Oh, come on, there's power in the name of Jesus. There's power in the mighty name of Jesus. And every war he wages, he will win. And I'm not backing down from any child. Thank 
what the enemy means. You take what the enemy meant for evil and you turn it for good. You turn it for good. You take what the enemy meant for evil and you turn it for good. You turn it for good. Take what the enemy meant for evil and you turn it for good. You turn it for good. You take what the enemy meant for evil and you turn it for good. You turn it for good. Come on, lift your arms. You take what the enemy meant for evil. And you turn it for good. You turn it for good. Yes, you do. Turn it for You take what the enemy meant for evil. And you turn it for good. You turn it for good. Yes. Yeah. I'm gonna see your victory. I'm gonna see your victory. Lift your voice to him this morning. Thank him for that. He's already won the battle. He's already went before you this morning. We worship you, Jesus. We bless you, Lord. We worship you, God. Oh, God. 
this morning. Just sing of his goodness. Just lift your voice this morning. Let's just press in just for a minute. We love you, Jesus. We honor you this morning, Lord. We give you glory for your goodness, Jesus. chorus one more time all my life.
the goodness of God. I will sing, I will sing of the goodness of God. Come on, if God's been good to you, let's give the Lord a good clap offering. Thank you, Jesus, for your goodness. Thank you, Jesus, for your goodness. We love you so, so very much. We love you so much. You may be seated this morning. Thanks again for being here in person and online. The online church is a part of our church family and, and just as important, just as important to us. So thank you so much for being here. Our kids are headed over to Kids Church this morning. Brent, Michelle, Mackenzie, thank you so much for joining us today and leading us in worship. We are very grateful and appreciate that. And uh, if you're a guest, would you do me a favor on, on those tables? At the back door where, the, where we receive our offering, there's a, a, a guest card. If you would do me a favor and just stop and fill that out and leave it, it will give Kim and I a chance to let you know how honored we are that you have chosen to be with us today. If you, if you are following on version, today's notes are on version. Just find the ridge at Broken Arrow, and they're there. You can, you can copy and paste to your page or put in your notes or, or however you, however you want to do that. How many of you know routines and habits... And predictability are incredibly important in our life. I mean, they are. We, we just count on that. Even people that think they like a lot, a lot of change really don't. You know, we all want some sense of normalcy. Um, and how I many of you know, for the last six months, our normalcy has been gone. There's nothing normal. And it, it, it almost feels like it, it, there's something about change that creates disequilibrium in our life. And it makes, us, um, it makes us a little tenuous and a little stressful and a little, and a little uncertain about what's going on. So the first thing we want to do is we always want to get back to stability. You know, it doesn't matter. And it, that can be a, like it can be what we've dealt with for the last six months, but it can be a job change. It can be a new baby. It can be a marriage. It can be all kinds of things. You have to find new routines and you have to find new habits. The, the problem is nothing... Nothing in the last six months lets us find that. It's like every day something new is thrown at us, right? New change. It's just not, not only the pandemic, but just all the changes that have happened to our economy. And, and, you know, we've already had a hurricane, and I'm listening to the news this morning. And, you know, it's like they tell us now two hurricanes are going to hit New Orleans this week. Two, back to back. <laughs> Aren't you glad we live in Tulsa? <laughs> Broken Arrow, <laughs> you know? And it's just one thing after another. And now I heard, I heard that there's a possible comet coming really close during the election. It's like, really? What day of revelation are we living in? <laughs> and, and you just can't find that. You, we all grasp for some normalcy, it, for something that feels it, it, it allows us to have certainty. And it's gone right now. All of that puts us in a very uneasy situation, and, and the stress is a little higher, and the anxiety is a little bit higher, and, and not knowing exactly what's going to happen is, is, makes us just a little bit like more. So, so the result is that affects us, which affects our relationships. It, it affects home life. It affects our friends. It affects church. It affects work. It affects everything. So this morning I want to speak on when everybody's crazy but you. Kim wanted me to title this, What to Do When Everybody's Crazy But You, because it rhymes and it's cute, but it's too long. <laughs> so, so I want to deal with relationships right now. I think this is one of the most important messages that I have really felt God put in my heart. Um, but how many of you know every week is the most important message God ever put in my heart? So kind of like my favorite verse is whatever verse I'm using that day. But listen, the people in your life, you know, they, can, they are so... We're so grateful for the people in our life. They, they enrich us. They bless us. They bring joy to us. They, they, we create wonderful memories together. But at the same time, relationships can get stressed and deteriorated. And the next thing you know, they're toxic and they're poisonous and they're destructive. So what do you do when you are in an unhealthy relationship? And I'm not just talking about in marriage. I'm talking about in life, whatever that might be. Because at some point, every relationship gets strained a little bit. Every relationship. It gets a little tense. You have to learn about each other. You have to learn. And how many of you know, just because we're Christians, we are not immune. <laughs> I love the Lord with all my heart. <laughs> but people are still people. 
And so, and so we have an example. In fact, we got so much in the Bible to dig through this morning. Paul and Barnabas. I mean, you know, you're talking about like heavy hitter Christians, way at the top, leaders, leaders in the church world. And they've got this great extraordinary friendship. Barnabas paved the way for the acceptance of Paul into the church world. And they traveled together. They were the first duo, Paul and Barnabas, the first duo. And, and they go, they take what's called the missionary trip where they plant churches there, spend about a year and a half traveling and having uh, evangelistic outreaches and planting churches and raising up leaders and then moving on. So, all, so they just have this extraordinary relationship until we reach Acts 15. In Acts 15, verse 36, after some time, Paul said to Barnabas, let's go back and visit each city where we previously preached the word of the Lord to see how the new believers are doing. That sounds good. We're off to a good start. Hey, we, we traveled together for... Listen, if you want to travel with somebody again after you've been with them every day and night for a year and a half, that's pretty good, right? There's really nobody but Kim I want to spend that much time with, <laughs> right? Don't look at me like that. <laughs> so Barnabas agreed and wanted to take along John Mark. But Paul disagreed strongly since John Mark had deserted them in Pamphylia and had not continued with them in their work. Their disagreement was so sharp that they separated. The relationship got unhealthy. It, it, it became strained. What do we do in an unhealthy situation? With, with all that is going on in the world right now, with all the... All the uh, constant shifts. It feels like every day we wake up and our world is on shifting sand. It's just moving beneath our feet. So what do we do when that happens? What do we do when a relationship has gotten a little bit unhealthy? Or, or there's just somebody like that in your life? I'm glad you asked because we're going to deal with that today. So number one, you've got you to gotta recognize the signs of an unhealthy relationship. The first thing to do is recognize when a relationship is unhealthy. Relationships are supposed to be mutual. There's reciprocity. There's give and take. There's mutual benefit. Everybody, everybody gives and everybody receives. It's not one-sided. An unhealthy relationship is when one person has the upper hand over somebody else. They don't want 50-50. They want 60-40 or 70-30. You know, the bigger the gap, the better they feel. And, and they want to be in a place where they're just a little bit over you, where they just control you. That's an unhealthy relationship. Anybody who wants to control you in a relationship, that's an unhealthy place to be. And so I'm gonna, we're going to work our way through some of the tactics. These are not all, but, but and we're going to show in the Bible how does that look like. So here's some of the tactics, an unhealthy relationship. Here's, here's what a controller does. First of all, they will use insincere charm or flattery. It, but it's insincere. There's a difference between sincerely flattering people that you love and honoring them and insincerity over them. So Delilah and Samson, they are the couple in the Old Testament. Samson, he is captain of the football team. He is good looking. He is well built. He, he, he's a physical specimen. And he is a ladies man. I mean, he is, every girl turned their head when Samson came through. You know, and so he has quite a history with women. You go study his life sometime. So, and so along comes Delilah, and she is, she's the head cheerleader. <laughs> she is a knockout, and she is a beauty queen. And, and when they see each other, the stars align, the world stops spinning. They become the Old Testament power couple, except Delilah wants this unequal. She wants to have an upper hand. She doesn't want this mutuality of give and take and love. And, no, 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 no. She wants to hold Samson in a place of, that she can control him. So God had given Samson incredible strength, unbelievable strength. And, and so um, Delilah wants to know what's the secret of that. What's the secret of that? Three times she says, tell me your secret, Samson. Now, she didn't want to know. She wants to trap him and give him to the Philistines. But she's, she's playing the charm card. And so she, she uh, flirted with him, and she charmed him, and she flattered him, and she mesmerized him to get what she wanted. Twice it fails. And so the third time she says this. This is a classic controller statement. How can you say you love me when you won't tell me? 
Conditional love is a sign of a controller. How can you, it's just, I love you. If, you lo if somebody says to you, if you love me, you will, uh-uh. There's a period after I love you. No more sentence. So Judges chapter 16, verse 16 says, It came about when she pressed him daily. I mean, she is on a mission. You know, she, she's trying to get his attention anyway. I mean, the lipstick's getting brighter. <laughs> the hair's getting blonder. <laughs> she is pouring it on to charm him to get what she wants out of him. And it's not a sincere love. She wants to exploit him. One of the tactics of a controlling person is they use flattery and charm to get something out of you. And, and, and you know that because there's a request. And here's how you know it's an unhealthy relationship. You can't say no. If there's somebody in your life that they can so charm you and so flatter you that you can never say no, that's not healthy. That's not healthy. So, so that's one. Number, uh, the next one is blame. If they, if, if, and, and they use these, and some of them, they use them all together and whatever. So these are just some of the characteristics. Well, the next one is blame. Someone who's in a controlling relationship is never responsible for anything. It is somebody else's fault. It is usually your fault, you know. And, and that a high-level controller, they have the capacity to make it about you. It's something you did. So Aaron and Moses are the classic. We looked at them several weeks ago. I want to just visit that. Moses has been on the mountain with God. He's getting the Ten Commandments. Aaron has been left in charge. While he's in charge, the people rebel. They, they want a golden calf. They create the golden calf. Chaos, it, it, it just, chaos abounds. And so Moses comes down, and Moses confronts Aaron, and he says, what did you let these people get out of control? Why did you let this happen? Here's a controller. Aaron turns to the tacky to blame. Moses, it's not my fault. It's not my fault. Look, at, you know these people. They're crazier than a loon. <laughs> and nobody can control these people. You can't. Nobody can control these people. They, you, know, you know how impossible they are. They threw their gold and their silver into this fire, and poof, out popped a golden calf. Listen, controlling people have an uncanny, uncanny ability to not only defer responsibility, they can make you the blame. There's a little bit of a hint here. Moses, if you'd been here, this wouldn't have happened. <laughs> that, that's, what, that's what a controller does. They, 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 they turn it on you so that it's your fault. If you had done this, I wouldn't have done that. Abusive people do this. Abusive people will not take responsibility for their abuse. They make it about you. You set my temper off. You pushed my envelope. You pushed me over the... No, no. It's the controller. <laughs> and they make you always feel responsible. You just always feel the blame. It's my, something I did. And it's the blame. Thirdly is guilt. Another thing they'll turn to is just guilt. They'll pour on the guilt. They will shame you into acting the way. They will shame you into getting what they want out of you. And they will make you feel bad if you don't do it. Herodias and Herod in the New Testament. Herod, uh, John the Baptist had confronted King Herod. Herod took his brother's wife Herodias from his brother and married her. And, and John the Baptist called him out on it. And they were not happy about that. So Herod has, her, has John the Baptist thrown in jail. So then Herod throws this big party. I mean, he, it's, a, it's his own birthday party. He throws himself a birthday party. If nobody will throw you a birthday party, throw your own. <laughs> you know? so, he had, and so all of his financial people are there. All of his favorite politicians are there. All of his admirers are there. And, and we don't know exactly. Sometimes there are things that happen in the Bible that just make you say, how, how did we get there? So, you know, they're having this great party, and I'm sure there's wine, and I'm sure people are, are getting inebriated. And so Herodias' daughter comes out, and she dances before everybody. And, her, and Herod is watching. Everybody's watching. When it's over, Herod, I don't know if he's inebriated or he's just caught up in the moment or whatever, but he jumps up. Bravo! Bravo! Ask me anything you want. Anything. I will give you anything up to half of everything I have. And Herod, Her, uh, Herodias' daughter says, could I have a moment? Hey, Mom, go with me to the powder room. <laughs> and so they're gone, and, they, and, and so she says to her mom, Herodias, what should I ask for? 
This is a bitter woman right here. She says, tell him you want the head of John the Baptist on a silver platter. So they go back out, and she says, okay, King Herod, I know what I want. Oh, anything, up to half the kingdom, anything. I want the head of John the Baptist on a platter. That's an awkward moment. When you say that, that's just a little bit awkward. So he's got he's to follow through, though. Mark chapter 14, verse 9, although he was grieved, the king commanded it to be given because of his oath. So he's made this big boast out in front of everybody, and now they are using guilt. Herodias is behind the scenes. She's using guilt to get what she wants. Controllers will do that to you. They will say things like, but you promised. Or, but you said. They will make you feel guilty. And they will make you really feel bad about yourself. And listen to me. Watch me. One of the biggest things a controller will say, I thought you were a Christian. They'll say something like, well, that's some way for a Christian to act. They'll, they'll throw our walk with God in our face. Because what they want to do is push you into a corner to get the lesser side of your humanity to come out so that they can act aghast that you're not living a Christian life. So they, and they just want you to feel in this place of, of you're just, ob I'm just obligated. I'm obligated. Next one is threats. They will threaten you. If you don't do this, I'll do this. So that happens with Jacob and Esau. And so Jacob, and, and again, this is another one of the, those that make me shake my head. Jacob and Esau are twins, but e Esau is a little bit, Esau is the firstborn. So, and mom and dad play favorites. Mom, mom's favorite is Jacob, dad's favorite is Esau. So they grow up in this very competitive, very um, uh, difficult situation where there's a lot of animosity between them. So one occasion, Esau is out hunting. He's out hunting, he's having a great time, and he comes back in, but he didn't get anything. You know, it's one of those hunter trips where you come back empty-handed. He has nothing. When he walks in, though, Jacob, he's kind of the mama's boy. He's learned how to bake. He's learned how to cook. He's Guy Ferrari. He's got this big stew going on. And it just, when Esau walks in, it smells so awesome, and it's so good. So, so Jacob says to Esau, oh, my gosh, that stew, that just smells so awesome. Can I, have, can I have a bowl of it? And so Jacob's smart because Esau's the older brother. The older brother got twice the inheritance of the younger brother when dad passed away. So Esau, or, uh, Jacob says, I'll let you have a bowl if you'll give up your birthright. If you'll let me get twice as much as you when dad dies, I'll, I'll let you have a bowl. And so, Je uh, so Esau said, oh, come on. I, I just want, no, you're not getting it. This is, a, this is a threatener. I'll eat the whole stinking pot right here in front of you. <laughs> but you're not getting it. And so, now, I, I don't know, how hungry can you be after one failed trip? I don't know. But Esau says, I'm starving. I'm dying here. If I die, it won't do me any good anyway. You can have it. Now, for a long time, I always thought, when I would read that about this stew, I always thought, that must be some beef stew recipe. <laughs> I mean, I need that. That's got to be some kind of beef stew recipe, you know. And I'm thinking, you know, there's got to be these big chunks of beef because that's the way I like mine, you know. And, and it's aromatic and it smells so good. But you go back and read it. it it's not beef stew. It says it's lentil stew. Lentils are beans. You give up hat. You give up what you're going to give over vegetable soup. I gotta have meat. You want, you want to get something out of me? I gotta have meat. So I'm just telling you, y'all invite me to a vegan party. I'm out. <laughs> <laughs> I am a carnivore. <laughs> so, so threateners. Here's what a, th a threatener will use power over you. They will, they will work their way and worm their way with power. And then the last one is manipulation. And then they, they're just manipulated. They just twist everything. And the, the classic is Mary and Martha. Jesus comes to the home of Mary and Martha. It's one of the disciples. It's, one, it's Jesus' favorite place to go. Mary, Martha, Lazarus. Brothers and sisters. Jesus always goes there. One time he's coming through. He just shows up unannounced. He's got all 12 disciples with him. So Martha, she jumps into full-blown Martha Stewart mode. 
I mean, she's in the kitchen, and she's banging pots and pans, and she's slamming cabinets. She's creating this gourmet meal for Jesus and the twelve. In the meantime, Jesus starts teaching. They're relaxing, they're resting in the living room, and, and he starts teaching, and Mary kind of, she likes that. So Mary just sits right down. She's just sitting at the feet of Jesus. She's oblivious to what Martha is doing. She's just caught up in what Jesus is doing. And on one of her trips by, Martha catches a sight of her sister Mary sitting there on her blessed assurance. She can't believe this is going on. Now, you've got to read this for yourself because you, it's amazing the detail that is there that enhances the story. She goes up to Jesus. Now, watch this. She goes up to Jesus. Jesus hasn't moved. The 12 are there. My, Mary is sitting at the feet of Jesus. Mary is there. But here's what Martha does. Martha looks at Jesus. She doesn't say, hey, Mary, would you come in? No, no, no. She says to Jesus, don't you care that my sister is sitting there while I'm burning up in there for you? <laughs> You've got to love this because this is passive aggressive at its best. She won't say it to Mary. She says it to somebody else. That's what passive-aggressive people will do to you. They won't tell you. They'll, they'll tell everybody else. And now they'll put it on their little social media. Don't even let me get there. <laughs> Listen, nobody asked Martha to do it. Jesus didn't walk in and said, okay, we need, a, we need an amazing meal like now. Jesus was like, crackers and water, we'll be okay. And, and here's what unhealthy people do. They will use those or a combination of them. But their goal is to keep the upper hand. They want to keep an upper hand over you. They want to control you. They want you to feel obliged to them. They want you to feel obligated and responsible to them. Healthy relationships are not based on feeling guilty or shamed or manipulated or twisted or anything else. Anytime you feel another person is trying to keep you in that position, that is not healthy. And that is not good. And that is not God. And sometimes it's hard for us, because we're Christians, sometimes it's even hard for us to believe that somebody would do that to us, that they would try to control us, because we're followers of Jesus. We want to give everybody the benefit of the doubt. We want to believe the best of everybody. And sometimes you just have to realize that, that they, they're, they're, they're a controller. They're, they're trying to get you. And they want to make it about you, but it's not you, it's them. It is them. They are the unhealthy person. Listen, unhealthy people cannot have healthy relationships. They can't. And listen, we all make mistakes. Everybody in here is making mistakes. We make mistakes. We do our best to walk the way that Jesus says, but we still fall into our humanity, and there's still that comes along. But let me just push this a little bit farther this morning since I'm already down this trail. Even, when we, even, with, even with Christian couples, this can happen, that we say that we forgive. You know, somebody does something, and they need to be forgiven, and we say we forgive, and we want to move on, and we all want, every one of us wants grace given to us, right? We all want grace. Now, watch me. If somebody says they've forgiven you, but they're in a place of wanting to hold you and have the upper hand, they haven't forgiven you. Mm. Here's what it looks like. <laughs> I'm going to preach now. Here's what that looks like. You're going along. You, you, something's happened. You've forgiven each other. You're moving along. Things are going pretty well. But then you hit another little bump. You hit a little snag. You hit something in life that comes along. If the other person starts reminding you of your failure, they haven't forgiven you. Watch me. If you've really forgiven somebody, you have given up the right to use their failure as a weapon in the future. You have given, you have forfeited that. It is over. So the first step towards a healthy relationship is acknowledge when it's unhealthy. Because it will never get better until you recognize that. You, you, you know? So number two, you've got to work towards a healthy relationship. You've got to work towards it. And the goal is health. This is the way God wants us to have healthy, good relationships. Where there's give and there's take and there's harmony and there's respect. And there's honesty. And there's admiration. That's what a healthy relationship looks like. And two of my favorite verses on this subject. Romans 12, 18. If possible, so far as it depends on you, be at peace with all men. That's an awesome verse. But unfortunately, it only takes one person to keep it unhealthy. 
You can be the healthiest person in the world, emotionally, spiritually, mentally. You can be the healthiest person in the world, but it only takes the other side being unhealthy. And you only have to go as far as it depends on you. It doesn't say you've got to fix them. That's between them and God. You just got to focus on you. Hebrews 12, 14 says, work at living in peace with everyone. Now, both of those, uh, those scriptures use the word peace, but I want to unpack this just a little bit more. Listen, a peaceful relationship and a healthy relationship are not the same thing. A healthy relationship is peaceful, but a peaceful relationship can still be unhealthy. I'm going to explain that. Hang on. <laughs> In, an unhealth, in a healthy relationship, things are resolved and they're good. Peace is the byproduct. Health is the first. Peace comes along. Let me explain it this way. Well, I go and I work out. And, and I just, I, when I work out, like especially when I run, I just, I know it's probably not nice and sure. I sweat. Like you can't believe. It, and I, my face gets red. Like I, I'm going to stroke out. It just, it's just the way it is. I mean, Kim's amazed. I mean, you can literally, uh, you wring water out of my clothes. I just sweat like a maniac. Now, listen, sweat is the result of my exercise. But I can sweat just because it's hot and not be exercising. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> I think it's good. <laughs> I kind of like my own preaching this morning. <laughs> A healthy relationship will always bring peace. But peace will not always bring health. Because here's the deal. It can look peaceful, but it's unhealthy. Because a controlling person wants an unhealthy view of peace. They don't want peace. They want you to keep your mouth shut. Mm. They want you, don't push my buttons. They want you to do what they want. And as long as they're getting what they want, everything's going to be fine for them, but not for you. So it takes everybody working together to have a healthy relationship. One side cannot do all this. Sometimes you just got to deal with some stuff. And listen, sometimes the road to healthy is rocky. <laughs> I mean, we have all these verses and all that stuff, but it's not. There is a process. Unhealthy people cannot have healthy relationships. And some people have been so empowered by people around them all their life who've ignored them and overlooked them and made excuses for them that this is going to be really, really difficult to deal with. And it's going to get really rocky and a little uncomfortable. And those of us who love Jesus, when it starts to get a little tense, we are tempted to re reel it back in and back off because we don't want to make it awkward. Let me give, I'll just give you a perfect example. Several years ago, I was pastoring a church, and there was a man in that church. He was the poster child for control. He had controlled that church for years. And, and he was known to rule the whole church. He ruled everything that happened in that church. And he had learned to run over everybody and get everything he wanted. And you know what people would say? Oh, that's just the way he is. He's just the way he is because you allow it. So when I got there, at first, everything was hunky-dory and awesome until I went to a direction he didn't want to go. And so I started down that pathway, acquiesce, I'm going to appease, I, I, I don't like discomfort. Listen, I don't, I, don't like, I don't like confrontation. People that thrive on confrontation, I don't understand that. I don't, my favorite phrase in the world is, I like Mike. I don't want to hear people say, I dislike Mike. I like Mike. It's got a nice little ring to it. <laughs> so something happens in that church, and his control issues go up, and he starts wanting to control me, and I started down that, and I realized he has no intention of acknowledging that he's doing wrong, or this is not right, or this is not the way it was supposed to be. So he was determined to have a showdown. I didn't want a showdown. I did everything I could to dance around and avoid that. For the first time, I've pastored for 25 years now. For the first and only time in 25 years of pastoring, I had to send somebody a letter who said, you cannot come here until you resolve this with me and the board. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> now, wouldn't you like to think, 
and everybody lived happily ever after. <laughs> oh, no, because we're living in the nasty now and now. <laughs> so he went on a road trip to all the old timers that the big bad pastor had kicked him out of the church. And he told all these things. And everybody's mad at me. The old timers are all mad at me. I'm, I'm just being a good, godly pastor. And these people are all wigged out about that. And they put all this pressure on me. Poor little guy got kicked out of church. And they were upset. And there's this pressure for me to let it all go. And so I had to go on my own road trip. And I took the letter with me. All those, I said, see this letter? It just says you can't come back until you've met with the pastor and the board to resolve your, your frustrations. That's all it said. I didn't know it said that. <laughs> and, and, and the people said, well, you can't kick somebody up. That's not Christian. Read Corinthians. <laughs> there was one boy causing trouble in the church of Corinthians, and Paul said, he's out <laughs> until he changes. In fact, Paul took it farther than I did. Paul said, turn him over to Satan until he learns not to do that. <laughs> See, I wouldn't do that. <laughs> you really have to push me a long way for me to say, okay, get him, Satan. <laughs> Sick him. And second of all, I didn't kick him out. I just said, we got, you got to resolve this stuff. you got to resolve this stuff. So it gets awkward. So let me, while I'm doing this, because everything in our church, we have a wonderful church. How many of you know, this is a really wonderful church. We have harmony. We have unity. But let me tell you, there are three kinds of people in church. Sheep are the vast majority of us are sheep. We, we love Jesus. We love each other. We love the church. We're sheep. Jesus calls us sheep. But then there are goats. And goats are troublemakers. <laughs> goats want to butt everything around. <laughs> and they want to cause confusion, and they, they, want to, they want to kick things up. And then if the goat, then wolves. <laughs> and wolves want to just devour and destroy and, and let them off. So I'm just telling you, as long as I'm pastor here, I'm going to pastor you, and I'm going to love you. But I'm telling you, if a goat or a wolf walks in this church, I'm going to run them off. They are not welcome here. <laughs> Amen? <laughs> you got your issues. You got issues from another church. Don't bring your guns here. Because <laughs> we got it good, right? Life is good here. And pastors are afraid to deal with this. And I don't even like dealing with this. But sometimes we have no issue. We have no goats. There's no goats as far as I know. No wolves. No wolves as far as I know. But I'm just telling you, here's what they will do. They will, a wolf will put on sheep's clothing and go to the other sheep and say, Oh, they picked on me and they were so hard on me. Just ask to see their teeth. If they got things, they're a wolf. <laughs> And they're not staying here. They're just not going to stay here. We're not going to do that. So you've got to work. So sometimes in your life, you've got somebody and they're a goat or they are a wolf. And you've got you to work toward health. And that means praying. That means, uh, that means talk it out. That means go to counseling. But it means at some point you cannot let this thing stay unhealthy. You cannot. It's not good for you. It's not good for you. So number three, you have to set healthy boundaries. When the other side will not budge, when they will not budge, when they will not talk, when they will not pray, when they will not reason together, when they won't do that, then sometimes you got to set a really healthy boundary. Romans 16, 17. Now, dear brothers and sisters, I give you one final word of caution. Watch out for those who cause division and offenses. When they antagonize you by speaking of the things that are contrary to the teaching that you've received, don't be caught in their snare. Here's what a healthy boundary says. A healthy boundary says, we're not going to act that way. Amen? It doesn't matter if it's the church life or marriage or family or best friends. We're not going to act that way. We're not, we're, not, we're not going there. Sometimes you have to draw a line that says, I love you. I'm related to you. But you're not going to treat me that way. And it's not easy for a lot of us. Because all of us, we, we like... We don't want to, because they, again, the controller will make this, you did this, you blew this up. No, you just said, I'm a human being created in the likeness of Jesus Christ, and I'm not going to be treated like a doormat. I'm not your rug. 
Sometimes you have to do that for the person you love. You have to step up and you have to say, you're not going to treat my spouse that way. My kids that way. This is the line. You cannot cross it. And every time they, every time they dare, you go, uh-uh. It's like an electric fence. Shock them. <laughs> In the love of Jesus. And sometimes you have to go so far as to say, I can't see you until you're ready to deal with this. I, I'm not. I'm done. Until you want to fix this and you want us to have a healthy relationship, I'm done. Because I'm not going to be manipulated or guilted or blamed or threatened. Because they will never stop. Now listen, that means you may have to unfriend them. You may have to block them. And when it's family, that's really, really hard because they will kick and they will scream and they will try to draw other family members into the mess because that's what controllers do. They need control. And they're trying to get you back under their control. They once had the upper hand. You've said it's not going to be that way anymore, so they got to try to gain control. Here's the toughest thing you got to do. Here's the toughest thing you got to do. When you do that, because we all worry, what is, what, what's everybody else going to think? What if... What if what if the family believes them instead of me? What if, what if the church believes them instead of me? You, you just got to say, Lord, I cannot control that. And I put that in your hands to let the truth fall. I, I, I put it in your hands. You, you got to let the truth out. I can't help what you think about me. Although I want to. <laughs> two, two verses and we're done. Second Timothy chapter 2.23. It's not, it's not on the screen or in the notes because I found it uh, late last night while I was getting, going through my notes one more time and, or yesterday, yesterday afternoon. St listen, oh, but these words are awesome. Stay away from all the foolish arguments of the immature for these disputes will only generate more conflict. I'm not fighting. I'm not arguing. I'm not going there. Now, me and you, those of us that are healthy, it makes no sense for an unhealthy person to want to keep it unhealthy. But that's how they've learned. That's how they've learned. And listen, if you have to walk away from a relationship, I'm not saying you've got to lock the door and barricade it. But I'm just saying that door is closed until there's a willingness to have real change. Amen. <laughs> One more. Proverbs chapter 20, verse 24 and 25. Again, this is not in your notes, but maybe jot it down. Don't be friends with people who become angry easily. Don't stay around quick-tempered people. If you do, you may learn to be like them. Then you will have the same problems they do. Wow. I love this quote that, that, that is on the screen. In the end, there doesn't have to be anyone who understands you. They just have to be someone who wants to. Isn't that a powerful quote? You, you may not understand me, but if you just want to, we'll go a long way down the road together. Amen? Amen. Will you stand with me? Brent, would you come back and will you stand with me this morning? When we're finished today, would you let Brent and Michelle know thanks for coming and serving our church and leading us into the presence of God with worship today. But right now, with every head bowed and every eye closed, those of you that are online, bow your heads and close your eyes. Because <laughs> here's my question. How many of you right now, in, 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 the, in the world that we're living in, there's so much tension and there's so much anxiety and there's so much uncertainty that our country as a culture is on edge? And when I'm on edge as a person and you're on edge as a person, it's really easy for things to get unhealthy. 
So how many of you this morning are dealing with a person in your life and it's unhealthy? And you need, you need the strength of the Lord to start down the road toward making it healthy. Would you just raise your hand? Oh my goodness. Oh my goodness, hands all over this building today. Father, in the wonderful name of Jesus Christ, I thank you that scripture is so real and it's so true and it's so practical. And Father, there are so many hands and, and probably people all over that are watching with us today, worshiping online, have a hand in the air as well. God, the goal is, is healthy relationships. So I pray for every person that's in an unhealthy situation. doesn't matter who it is. It may be at home, as close as a spouse. It may be family. It may be friends. It may be the neighbor next door. It may be somebody they work with. But God, today, today, help us to start moving toward health. Help us not to give in to the false pretension of peace because we keep our mouth shut. Help us to start moving toward real health health father i pray for the person on the other end maybe they have learned some really bad habits in life maybe they didn't see a healthy healthy people skills modeled growing up so lord open their eyes and open their hearts begin to work your change inside of them lord god because none of us wants to end the relationship we just want to make it healthy. We want the ground to be level. We want it to be enjoyable and pleasurable and joyful. So I pray, God, that the mighty hand of the Lord would rest upon our people today, Lord. And help me to be healthy, Lord. Deal with anything in my heart that makes me unhealthy. Any inclination in me, Lord, that might, that might make things unhealthy, Lord. I, I don't want to be that way. Not for a moment do I want there to be anything in me that would create unhealth. So, Lord, deal with all of our hearts. That this, that deal with our side of the equation as well. Lord, this won't be, this, this, is a, this is a journey. This is a process. But let us start down the journey toward healthy, vibrant, wonderful relationships. In Jesus' incredible, incredible name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you so, so much for being here today. You have blessed my heart. And I hope this is one you'll go and share because I, I really believe this is one of the most practical messages I've had in a while. So we love you. I'll see you online Wednesday night. If you can help us go to the school and paint, see Pam Roberts. If you can uh, are willing to help us in nursery or preschool, if you'll go by and just let Tracy know. Have a great day, everybody. Have a great day.